Mark Griffiths is an author, doctor, educator, and addiction expert. Dr. Mark Griffiths is a chartered psychologist and distinguished professor of behavioral addiction at the Nottingham Trent University and director of the International Gaming Research Unit. He has spent 33 years in the field and is internationally known for his work into gambling, gaming, and behavioral addictions. He has published over 1,100 refereed research papers, six books, 160 plus book chapters, and over 1,500 other articles. He has won 23 national and international awards for his work, including the John Rosecrantz Prize, 1994, CELEJ Prize, 1998, Joseph Lister Prize, 2004, and the U.S. National Council on Problem Gambling Lifetime Research Award 2013. He also does a lot of freelance journalism and has appeared on over 3,500 radio and television programs and written over 350 articles for national and international newspapers and magazines. You can read his blog at drmarkgriffiths.wordpress.com or you can follow him on Twitter. So, Mark, um, I, I want to ask... We're going to be talking a lot about social media and addiction and um, what you're aware of with that. And then my what my experience has been, which is why I reached out to you in the first place. But I want to know, uh, when did psychology and slash or addiction become a real passion of yours that you decided um, that you wanted to further your education in it and you wanted to make a living at it? How early did this really become part of your life? Uh, well, to be honest, Isaac, I, I actually wanted to be a journalist and I went to university. I mean, I, I had done, in England, we have something called A-levels, which is advanced qualifications. And I did maths, physics, chemistry and biology. And to be honest, I hated all of them, really didn't like it at all. Um, and I decided I wanted to do something I thought would be the total antithesis of these hard science. And so I chose psychology to do uh, my degree at my first university. And really, the reason I went to university is, uh, as I say, I wanted to be a journalist. So I quickly um, joined the student's newspaper, um, joined the, the, the university radio station to be a DJ. And within, my, within a year, I was the editor of the, the student's newspaper at um, what's called Bradford University. That's the university I went to here um, in England. Um, and to be honest, I, <laughs> the end of my first year, I... Um, I basically had what's called my, my LEA grant withdrawn for non-attendance. I didn't really attend much in my first year at all. I spent so much time um, basically with the students' union, my, my working for the students' newspaper and working for the, the university radio station that I didn't have much time to, to um, actually work a lot. Um, but then in my second year, um, I, I kind of got into going, you know, going to a few lectures. You know, I, I miraculously past my, I mean, I scraped through my exams at the end of the first year, and thankfully none, none of those exams counted towards my degree result. Um, and then the second year, I just basically went to all the, all the, the lectures and the, the topics that actually contributed to my degree score. And then by the third year, um, I went to every, I didn't miss a single lecture, and I ended up, and I got the highest um, score in my, in my year. I, got, I was the only person to get what's called a first class honours degree in psychology, and I was only 20. When I got my degree, um, and then you know people were saying you know I should do a PhD, and I didn't know what a PhD was, to be honest. And so I went for um, three interviews, uh, and each of the, these were all for PhD positions. And one was on face processing, one was on adolescent gambling, and one was on gynecological problems in women post-pregnancy. Um, and I got offered uh, through these three PhDs. Um, but I, looking at them, I, I thought the one on adolescent gambling would be the one that would be most interesting, mainly because there'd been loads of research on face processing, loads of uh, papers on and research on gynecological problems in, in women. But um, adolescent gambling, this was almost a, a blank canvas. Uh, and I also knew from personal experience, I mean, my, we, I, I grew up in a family uh, with a younger brother who uh, ended up in prison. Um, um, you know, he was a complete delinquent while he was he was growing up, um, and he was a, a person that ended up, for instance, selling everything in his room um, to to fund his his playing of slot machines. So I knew actually from a a kind of personal angle that adolescent gambling was a big issue. We have a very unusual situation in this country that um, uh, slot machines are actually legally allowed to be played on by children 
if they're housed in what we call family leisure centres and seaside arcades, and that's still the case to today, believe it or not. Um, and so um, I, I, did, I decided to do my PhD on slot machine addiction. And I have to be honest, it's probably the best um, choice I ever made in my life. I realized very, very quickly that um, there was very little research that had been done on slot machine addiction and particularly on adolescent slot machine addiction. So I spent uh, basically between 1987 and 1990 doing that PhD. While I was doing that, that PhD, uh, I also really, I mean, I spent a, a large amount of time in amusement arcades, which is where most slot machines were housed. But they, these are also the places where video games were housed as well. So I also realized there was a kind of crossover between the people that were playing slot machines, but also the people that were playing video games in there as well. And then in, in kind of 1990, I started um, researching on video game addiction. So once I'd finished my three years on slot machine addiction, although obviously I loved what I did, I actually did want to, to do something a bit different. So over the next kind of 25 years, I mean, I start, as I say, I started doing research on video game addiction in 1990. Then in 1995, I was the very first person in the world to publish a paper on internet addiction. Uh, so, sorry, it was published in 1996. I started researching in 1995. Um, there was a, a woman in the US called Dr. Kimberly Young. Uh, she was also researching, and we were both at that particular time corresponding with each other on this new thing called email. Um, you know, when I when I think back, I'd never even heard of the internet until I think it was March 1995. And then as soon as I'd heard about it, um, I then started doing research in it. And I say Kimberly was doing, Kimberly Young was also doing research on this. And uh, we both pu published the first, well, well, she always claimed she published the first paper on this area, but she actually published it in December 1996. And I published mine in November 1996. So we were both basically doing the same kind of thing, but she was doing it in America and I was obviously doing it here in the UK. And then in 1997, I started working on research on exercise addiction. Then in 2001, I started on uh, research on sex addiction. 2005, I then started doing research on work addiction. And then it was around about 2010 that I started doing research on social media addiction. So obviously, in terms of all of those, those different areas, I mean, all of these areas involve um, the, uh, you know, looking at addictions that don't involve the ingestion of a psychoactive substance. Uh, and, you know, there'll be a lot of people out there listening who probably think, you know, we shouldn't be even considering things like social media or video game playing as a potential addiction. But of course, it will all come down to how you define addiction in the first place. I've, I've got a very specific way I, I conceptualize addiction, which I'm quite happy to go into, um, you know, maybe after your next question. But for me, you know, I because I passionately believe that, that gambling when taken to excess could be a genuine addiction. And I, you know, I, I published many, many papers um, during, during and after my PhD on this area. I mean, if you accept that somebody can become addicted to something like gambling, then what you're actually saying is that it is theoretically possible to become addicted to something that doesn't involve the ingestion of a psychoactive substance. And if you accept that basic premise that you can become addicted to something like gambling, there is then no theoretical reason why somebody couldn't, for instance, become addicted to sex or exercise or video game playing or um, social media, you know, and I, I often get accused of being of watering down the concept of addiction because I apply it to these other behaviours. And I've gone on record saying that I believe anything that has constant rewards, constant reinforcement, you know, any any behaviour that has that has the capacity to be potentially addictive. Now, the good news is is that based on my criteria for addiction, very few people would be classed as, for instance, addicted to social media or addicted to a video game. However, I think because I've applied it to these, what we call these behavioral addictions, is that, as I say, I, I, I get slammed um, saying that, I, you know, that these things are not, not really addictions, that, you know, we shouldn't really be studying these as an addi addiction. But as I say, it all depends on what, you're, what, what I call and my operational definition of what an addiction is in the first place. And I say I've got very specific criteria. And in fact, by my criteria, very few people will end up being yeah, classed as addicted because when I use the word addiction and apply it to things like social media, I'm using it in exactly the same way that I would apply the word addiction to the use of heroin or cocaine or alcohol or, or nicotine. So I'm not, you know, I want to compare apples with apples rather than apples with oranges. Um, so, I mean, if, if, you, if you just allow me, I mean, I think 
you know, people out there listening might be saying, okay, Mark, so, so what are your criteria of addiction? And so basically I have, I have six criteria, okay? And if anyone fulfills these six criteria, then I would operationally define that person as being genuinely addicted to that particular activity or that particular, uh, particular drug. My six criteria are what we call salience, mood modification, tolerance, withdrawal, conflict, and relapse. And if I just go briefly through those, so the first thing is this idea of what we call salience. And what I'm talking about here is that this is the single most important thing in this person's life. Here is something that they'll do to the neglect of everything else in their life. Um, it's, you know, even if they're not actually engaged in the behavior, they're thinking about the next time that they're going to engage in the behavior. So what we're talking about here is total preoccupation. Now, interestingly, I mean, I, I wrote a paper back in 2005 to answer some of the, the criticisms that I've got from my criteria, because some people said to me, well, you know, I know people addicted to alcohol or addicted to nicotine or addicted to cocaine. And, you know, they don't think about these things all the time. And that was that was right, because the thing about drug addictions is that people typically will have their drug of choice with them. OK, you know, whether you're an alcoholic or you're a cigarette smoker, is that you actually don't realize how important this activity is until you're prevented from engaging that activity. So, you know, if you're a nicotine addict and you're suddenly on a, you know, a 10 hour fl plane flight from London to New York, I can tell you now that nicotine does become the single po most important thing in that person's life very, very quickly on that aeroplane because they're obviously prevented from engaging in their, their drug of tro choice. So I, I, I call that reverse salience. So, you know, I applied this to drug addictions, basically trying to argue that this activity is very salient, but people don't realize it's very salient until they're, you know, that still they're prevented from engaging in that, that particular behavior. Um, and as I say, as soon as they then get their, their alcohol or their, their cocaine or their nicotine or whatever, is that then suddenly it's not the most important thing in their life because they're engaging that activity again. So that's, that's the first criterion, salience. The second one is mood modification. So I believe that all addictive behaviors, everybody who is genuinely addicted to a particular activity or a particular substance is using that activity or substance as a way of either, and there's a paradox to this, either to get buzzed up high, aroused, excited, or to do the exact opposite, to tranquilize, to escape, to numb, to de-stress, to relax. And in fact, people can use behaviors and activities even at different times of the day to get different mood modifying effects. So, you know, a nicotine addict might be the first couple of cigarettes in the morning is something that kind of gives them an, a, you know, a nicotine, a nicotine rush, or, you know, something that gets them going for the day. But by the end of the day, they're not using nicotine in that way at all. They're using it to de-stress de and relax. And people use activities like playing video games or gambling or sex or exercise, work even, is that people use, can use these activities to, to modify their mood. The third criterion is uh, what we call tolerance. So this is the idea that over time, built people spend more and more time engaged in a particular activity or take bigger and bigger amounts of a, of a particular drug to get those same initial mood modifying experiences you know so for a, someone addicted to gambling is that you know they might start it off gambling for 30 minutes an hour a day but over time not only do they increase the amount of time that they're spending spending eight nine ten hours a day but they're also having bigger and bigger bet sizes so you know they're not playing with a few dollars that you know they're betting with a few hundred dollars or even thousands of dollars and you know we see this in you know other types of behavioral addiction is that people tend to build up and spend more you know basically greater amounts of time whether it's playing a video game or being on social media then the fourth criterion is um uh, the idea of um oh, sorry, i forgot what i was going to say and um the fourth, fourth criteria is withdrawal uh, withdrawal symptoms and again for me somebody who is genuinely addicted to an activity or a substance if they're prevented from engaging in that activity or prevented from taking that substance is on a psychological level they will experience um, increased irritability increased moodiness increased frustration and on a physiological level even for non-drugs so even for activities i would expect a genuine gambling addict or a genuine social media addict if you're unable to engage in that activity what you would find is on a physical level that you will experience nausea, stomach cramps, you know, handshakes or whatever is actually physiological um, withdrawal symptoms um, as well. And then the fifth criteria, and this is the most important one, okay, and this is what we call conflict. So when I talk about conflict, what I'm talking about is that this activity is so all-encompassing that it conflicts with your 
occupation or education, depending on what age you are, it conflicts with your relationships in terms of the people you love, your children and your, your friends and colleagues. And it also uh, it engage, uh, also involves what I call intrapsychic conflict, conflict within yourself. You know that you're doing, you know, you know you're doing this activity too much. You know you should probably kind of cut down and stop, but you feel unable to do so and you experience a subjective loss of control. And again, um, one of the things that people always ask me, particularly the media, okay, Mark, what's the difference, if you like, between a, a healthy, excessive enthusiasm and an addiction? And for me, it's very simple. Healthy, excessive enthusiasms add to life and addictions take away from it. And on that very simple kind of rule of thumb, very few people would be classed as addicted to gaming, to social media, to exercise, to sex. It's because that, you know, their excessive amount of time they do this is actually life affirming rather than kind of life destroying. And then we've got the, the, the final criterion, which is relapse. And again, for me, any genuine addiction, if somebody has managed to give up for two days, two weeks, two months, or even two years, is that when people start engaging in that behavior again, they go straight back into the addictive cycles they were in before. Um, and as I say, I mean, Mark Twain, the American author, has got a lovely quote. And, you know, for me, smoking is the classic relapse behavior. And, he, you know, what is his, Mark Twain's quote was, um, giving up smoking is really easy to do. I've done it hundreds of times. And, uh, you know, for me, that really does encapsulate what relapse is all about, is that, you know, people just, as I say, they manage to give up for short or even long periods. And as soon as they start engaging in that gambling again or engaging in that smoking or drinking again, they go straight back into the, the cycles they, they were in before. Now, for me, so I've, I've outlined my six criteria. And those six criteria are all what I would call clinical criteria that you would find that have been traditionally based and used in, in drug, drug and substance uh, addictions, and I've applied them to behaviors. And for me, you have to actually fulfill all of those six before I personally would actually define you as being addicted. And you know, obviously using those very strict criteria, that is why very few people would genuinely be, for instance, addicted to social media or addicted to gaming, because they don't fulfill all of my six components. However, that doesn't mean the behavior might not be problematic. You know, and if we think all, you know, if we think of all behavior is that we're on a continuum here from obviously no use through to occasional use, through to regular use, through to excessive use, through to problem use, through to pathological and addictive use. And, you know, when, when I think about social media and, and gaming, particularly when people use, you know, and I, I don't know your experiences, Isaac, at all, and, you know, you may want to talk about your experience, and I'm not in any way saying that your behavior isn't addictive or isn't problematic, but it will all come down to how that, that definition of social media addiction or problematic social media use is actually defined in the first place. Because quite clearly, I mean, I look at it with my own students, you know, and I, I see them, you know, looking at social media, being on their smartphones, and, you know, they're not necessarily listening to me. And, you know, it's taking away, you know, time from their education, but that, you know, Having, you know, that would might be an example of, of a problematic use of social media without necessarily being addicted to it. And again, you know, I've got I've got three screen ages. My my three kids, they all spend a you know disproportionate amount of their, their day in front of screen based technologies. Um, now, you know, thankfully all my my three kids, you know, they're all now young adults and hopefully well adjusted adults. But you know, I, I you know, it's quite clear. I look at my daughter, you know, she quite easily spends two, three, four hours a day. On social media even though she's now finishing a psychology degree at university I'm sure she will get a degree but my guess is she would have been far more productive in her degree if she had not um, engaged with smartphone use at all I'm one of those bizarre individuals I, I actually gave up my smartphone about two years ago I've not used one at all people cannot believe that someone like myself who researches into social media addiction a smartphone addiction hasn't even got a smartphone myself I mean, I was one of those early adopters of mobile phones. I mean, I had a mobile phone back in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, you know, and I used to you, you know, use my phone, not all the time, because not lots of, you know, lots of other people didn't necessarily have. You know, I, you know my phone at the time was almost you know, like one, it was like a Nokia brick at the time. Uh, and obviously, when I gravitated on to, to smartphones, you know, I realized that you know, this was something that although I was obviously not addicted or I had a problem with it, it was taking time away from things that I personally thought were more important. So I've actually now learned to live without smart smartphones. And of course, that is, you know, can be really horrible sometimes when you're traveling around and, you know, you've missed a connection on your flight and you can't ring back home and say you're going to be five hours late 
I mean, those, those things kind of happen. Uh, but, you know, so, you know, the, for me, there's a difference between addictive use of things like social media, gaming, the internet, and there is a, um, you know, that doesn't mean you can't um, have, have problems, but, you know, you, you can have problems without necessarily being addicted by my criteria. But, of course, people have very, very, you know, very different criteria of what it is to be addicted to something. You can get 50 psychologists all in a room and we'll all give you a different definition of what it is to be addicted to something. I'm just going to go back a little bit. Okay. And it's directly related to what you just said there. So back in October is when I started to recognize what I then thought of as my social media addiction, in particular, Facebook. Okay. So, you know, I, I went within and I, I'm a spiritual person, so I meditated and, um, and I ruminated on this for a while. And when I look back at my Facebook usage from October till now, it's it's just gotten the the lapses in between interactions, postings and stuff got greater and greater. And now there's, you know, it might be a couple of weeks in between me making any post at all. Okay. Uh, um, and then reading your article on psychology today, watching the social dilemma, uh, just different things to kind of like try to educate myself. I began to realize, and you do specifically articulate this in your article on psychology today. Uh, I don't think that I'm actually addicted or that I was clinically addicted to social media, but I do think it became problematic. And so the way that that came to be was I've been using social media. I've been using Facebook for, for 10 years so you and I are roughly the same age. I'm a Gen Xer. I'm 47. So my life, my formative years, technology was really not a part of that with the exception of television and, you know, home entertainment type stuff, VCRs. But uh, when the smartphones came about, uh, or when just cell phones became kind of uh, commonplace, I put it off. I was like, who needs that? Everybody says they need it for emergencies. And I, you know, I go to the beach. I don't, I don't need that. And then I got something similar to the one you had. I could play snake when I was using the restroom and, you know, just uh, make phone calls, call to work, running late, things like that. And eventually I did get a smartphone and it became, it became a, an appendage at some point. And it still is because I'm an actor for a living. So I really, really must utilize all aspects of this iPhone because of my career. And um, if this were a different time and place in the world, then it wouldn't be as necessary. But because we're in a digital age, I have to have that. So most of the reason I go to Facebook anymore is either marketplace stuff because I've become a collector as well during the pandemic of old toys I used to have. And then acting stuff. That's the most of the time that I'm using it. So anyway, in October, I had this interaction with someone based on something innocuous, some, some trivial uh, sense of humor. Uh, I have a sense of humor that's all over the place, but I was making some kind of silly comment about something and someone came in and just started being very vitriolic. And, and I was aghast, like the interactions that we had had in, in real life, were forgettable for the most part. And she was a comedian. So I saw her do some stand up, and she was just going on and on and on. And this, this really like self-righteous indignant type of behavior that was just unmerited. And then I realized like, that's, I had been, I had done that so much. And the, my relationship with Facebook over a 10 year period of time, I had constructed the way that I, that this platform was a part of my life in a vitriolic way. I did because I'm, I'm also a former political activist. So there's plenty of self-righteous indignation on my part every time I used this platform over 10 years. So I created the problem and I would wake up thinking about posts on Facebook, go to sleep thinking about posts on Facebook, um, but not every single day. It wasn't until the pandemic when I was really relying on it as a way to stay connected to humanity that, that it really became more of like an addiction. So I, I just 
presented you with a, with a lot of stuff there. Maybe it's more simplified than what I thought, but would you say, first of all, based on what I told you that my interaction with Facebook has been an addiction or not? And yeah, first, just that, what, what do you think? Do you think that's a representation of addiction or not? Um, from what you said, Isaac, no. Okay, that doesn't mean that there aren't problematic as aspects that have crept into your life. But by my definition, absolutely not. Because what I would be expecting is that you would spend all of your time on Facebook without doing absolutely anything else. And as I say, I don't know um, how many acting jobs you've had and, you know, what, you know, in terms of your political activism or whatever. I mean, if Facebook was stopping you doing all these other things, that obviously might be indicative of that you've got an addiction here. Um, you know, you... I, I mean, I think that a lot of people, I mean, I get obviously get a lot of parents who pathologize their kids' behavior, you know, and they, you know, and what the kids are actually doing, they're engaged in habitual use. And for me, habitual use isn't addictive use, but habitual use, A, can still be problematic in terms of impinging on other areas of people's lives. You know, and habitual use is actually something that can lower productivity and obviously take away from both education or your occupation, depending on what, what age you are. And I'm not, in a way, I'm not, I'm not saying that that's not something we should be concerned about, because I think we should be concerned about, you know, things that just eat up, you know, all people's time. Uh, but having said that, can I just say, I mean, I, I'm a great lover of technology and, you know, the advantages of technology far, far outweigh the disadvantages. And I certainly don't um, want to, for us to, to live in an age where we haven't got access to all these wonderful um, devices. Now, obviously, I, you know, I, take, I, I took a, a, a particular decision to stop using a smartphone. Um, but, of course, I can still do, you know, I, on my iPod, I can, I've still got Wi-Fi access. So when I'm traveling around, it's, you know, I can still, you know, access things online and look at social media if I want to. And, I'm, you know, people always say that, you know, Mark, you know, why is it when I email you at, at 10 o'clock at night, you know, you'll get an answer from me, you know, very quickly. Because, you know, if I'm on my laptop, you know, that, that's what, what I'll do. Um, you know, and obviously, you know, people, for instance, they, they call me a work addict. Okay, they call me a workaholic. But again, I would argue that, you know, based on my definition, I can't possibly be addicted to work because there's little or no negative consequence by the fact that I spend a lot of hours a day working. Now, I, I just mentioned to you before, you know, my three kids are now all young adults. You know, they've all moved out of the house. You know, and I can, you know, I used to joke, but it wasn't really a joke, is that, you know, the birth of my first child cured me of any workaholic tendencies I had. Because I had, you know, I went from quite happily working 10, 11, 12 hours a day to suddenly not being able to work more than seven or eight hours a day because I had another human being that I actually had to spend time and look after. And people don't believe this, but it's absolutely true that, you know, for the first 10 years that my kids were, were growing up, I never, ever, ever worked a weekend. You know, for me, the weekends were sacrosanct. It was family quality time. Yes, I still worked hard in the week. I quite often, you know, be at my at my desk or my laptop at 7.30 and still working right through till 6, 6.30. But, you know, I made sure every night that, you know, I read to my kids, that I gave them their baths and did everything and spending time, you know, watching my kids grow up. But, of course, as soon as my kids kind of hit that early adolescence, suddenly they didn't need my, their dad any longer you know, they, you know, the only things they wanted me for was, was money, basically. And, you know, and I could see that, you know, my, my amount of work that I did built up. And of course, now, I mean, I, my, you know, my, my partner, she's a psychologist, we've been together 23 years together now, you know, the fact that we both, you know, after we've eaten, for instance, and then both get our laptops out and do, do a bit of work, the fact that, you know, there's no conflict there, because we're both love what we do. And, you know, we're both psychologists, we both, you know, work very hard, both love our jobs. You know, and so that, you know, if there's no conflict there, it can't possibly be an addictive behavior. And it goes back to what I was saying before, is that, you know, addictions don't occur in a vacuum. That, you know, so if I look to my, you know, if, if I transposed my behavior when I was 23, when I think when I just finished my PhD and got my very first job as a lecturer at a university, you know, I was having to work, not wanted to, but I had to work 10 to 12 hours every day, constantly preparing lectures on, on things I knew nothing about, you know, I'd literally come home from a, a day's lecturing and then work from five until two in the morning to try and prepare the lectures for the next day. And I was had lectures four days, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays and Thursdays. I was hardly taking time off work. I mean, if I was working like that when I, you know, had my three kids, then quite clearly that would be 
somebody who is addicted to work because you're ignoring your family and, and doing this other stuff. At the moment, I, I now, again, work really hard, but it's something I choose to do, and I'm, I'm what I call a happy workaholic. And, you know, there is a lot of literature showing that, you know, there's a difference between... Um, I, I completely separate about what's called workaholism from work addiction. Work addiction is something that really is quite negative in people's lives and cause health problems, etc. Whereas work, being a workaholic, um, you know, there are some people who are workaholics who are, you could class as being addicted to work, but there's a lot of workaholics who basically love what they do. There's no, little or no conflict in their life with their partners, their time on other things. And that's, that's me. You know, I love what I do. You know, I'm very lucky that, you know, I've spent the last 33 years basically doing what I want to do. Um, you know, and I, even though I work for a university, I'm effectively kind of self-employed. All the stuff that, I, that takes most of my time, whether it's being a gaming consultant or whether it's being my, my journalistic stuff or being a broadcaster or doing my TV programs or whatever, is that those things, you know, they, they, they're all things that I absolutely love and enjoy, enjoy doing. And, you know, even though I do a lot of this every single day, it's not interacting, you know, it's not interfering with my kids' lives because my kids aren't here anymore. It's not, inter you know, not interfering with my partner's life is because she's hardworking as well. You know, when we spend time together, we spend time together. And when we're, you know, decide that we're both working on our stuff, there's no conflict there. But that would be very different if I had a partner, but let's say she was a housewife and expected me to interact with her for five hours every single night, then that would be something that would, would cause problems. So again, it's not about the amount of time that you're doing something whether it's social media, gaming, work, sex, exercise, or whatever, it's about the, the negative impact it has on your life. And that is why there are so many people out there, and again, when we, particularly when I'm talking about social media use or gaming use, of people who do spend excessive amounts of time, but for the, the majority of that time, this is something, as I say, it's life enhancing. It actually makes them feel better, helps them raise their self-esteem. There's nothing wrong with that. When it, you know, it's, it's obviously when it starts to interfere, with your degree, your education, it starts to interfere with your job, it starts to interfere that you know, you're not interacting with your friends or your partner because you're just totally preoccupied by whatever this behavior or activity is, then that is when it starts to be problematic. And I, I'm not in any way diminishing you know, the experiences that you've gone through and saying that you know, you, you know, your own social media use quite clearly engage, you know, that resulted in some problematic things in your life. But I would argue from my, you know, my particular, what I call my operational definition of addiction, you know, you, Isaac, would not be classed as an addict by my definition. But that, I don't want to take away from the fact that you've recognized is that your Facebook use had, you know, negative knock-on effects in other areas of your life uh, and that, you, you know, you want to try and cut down and minimize that. You know, and for me, again, when I talk about addictions, because I work in the area of behavioral addiction, OK, I never, you know, I don't believe in the abstinence model whatsoever. You know, when I think, I mean, I'm not a practitioner. OK, I'm a psychologist, but I don't treat people for addiction. But if I did, my goal in treating a social media addict or a gaming addict or a sex addict or an exercise addict or a work addict, it would always be about getting that behavior under control rather than not be, you know, rather than being abstinent from it. And to be honest, things like you can't really be abstinent from exercise or abstinent from work, and I think it's unfair to be abstinent from sex. You know, these are things that, you know, are, are part and parcel of our lives and people should be doing them. But of course, what you don't want is that they're doing them 12 hours a day to the ne neglect of everything else in their life. And so, so for me, I say even for gambling, okay, you know, I do believe, you know, if, you, if you've had long sustained periods where gambling was in control but then for, for various external reasons so let's say you get divorced or you lose your job or death of a child i mean these there are some fairly major things that can happen in people's lives that act as triggers for why people suddenly start drinking suddenly start taking drugs suddenly start gambling you know obviously they're using it to blank out and escape this really horrible period in their life but those people if they have managed to have you know, a decade where they had no problem at all with this particular behavior. And then because of this trigger incident, they end up having a problematic period where this activity or behavior takes over their life. I do believe, you know, therapeutically, is that they could get back to a stage where they can control that, that activity, even for things like, as I say, gambling or drinking alcohol. You know, there's a, a couple of very famous psychologists, Mark and Linda Sabell, who in the 1970s advocated that some alcoholics uh, could actually get back to controlled levels of drinking. 
And again, they made the point that if you if you had been a, a social drinker for many, many years without any problems, and then due to circumstances beyond your control, you suddenly became alcoholic, is that they said, you know, those people could actually end up uh, having controlled drinking again. But it's very different from those who, you know, basically you, you become an alcoholic, alcoholic as soon as you start drinking or become a pathological gambler as soon as you start gambling. I mean, that is going to be much harder, much more resistant to treatment and ever getting back to a controlled level because you've never done that um, in the first place. And then, of course, you know, when we're talking about social media, I mean, you know, when we think about social media, smartphones, I mean, obviously there's, a, there's an absolutely inextricable link between social media and addiction and smartphone addiction. And can I just say for the record, even though I was the very first person in the world to publish a paper on internet addiction, and I've published papers on smart addiction, the thing I will say is obviously people are no more addicted to the internet or no more addicted to smartphones than alcoholics are addicted to bottles. Because really when we talk about internet addiction or smartphone addiction, we're not talking about addiction to the internet or addiction to the smartphone. We're talking about addictions on the smartphone or addictions on the internet. You know, for me, an online gambling addict or an online gaming addict, they're quite clearly for me, they're not internet addicts, okay? They are people that are addicted to gambling or gaming but using the internet to fuel these other addictions. Having said that, things like social media addiction is what we could say is a genuine internet addiction in the sense that, you know, this is an activity that only occurs online. You know, if I'm an online gambling addict and I, suddenly I can't gamble online, what do I do? I can go to a casino. I can go to a, a bookmaker shop or a bingo hall. If I'm, you know, a, an online gaming addict and I can't access the internet, I can play on my console. If you're addicted to social media, you don't then just suddenly walk into a big room and start talking to everybody offline. You know, there's no real offline equivalent of, of being addicted um, to social media. It, it's what we call a genuine internet addiction because it only happens online. But I would still argue that, you know, this, this term we use, internet addiction, it's a kind of umbrella term which basically refers to, you know, the, the use of um, excessive you know, use of these behaviours that it, you're actually addicted to this particular behaviour online rather than being addicted to the internet. Having said that, you know, I, 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 I published what, you know, a number of the first case studies that looked at people who did seem, if you like, to just spend all their time online. They were doing lots of different activities. You know, they were gaming, chatting to people, being in chat rooms, playing Dungeons and Dragons, role playing games. You know, so you do have some people of what I would call generalized internet addiction or generalized smartphone addiction in the sense that they spend all their time on these devices doing lots of different activities. But I would still argue you're not, you know, you're not addicted to the smartphone or not addicted to the internet. You're, you're addicted to the activities that you're doing on, the, on these particular devices. Before social media became a, a, a real thing, the computers had become normalized and technology had become a normalized part of, of our lives. And the early gamers and designers could... Uh, potentially all be thought of as introverts. They, and, and I'm an actor, so there are plenty of actors that say I'm an extroverted introvert. So they don't really like to be around a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of time, but yet they want to be on the spot, on the stage in a spotlight in front of thousands of people, millions of people if they're on to uh, movies and television. So they, they get their, their little dose and then they go back to their, their cave kind of a thing. And when social media first came about, um, with MySpace anyway, that when it was the first uh, kind of broadly used social media platform, I knew introverts that loved MySpace. They, they were on MySpace all day long. And when I finally decided to jump on MySpace, this was like 2007, I, I just didn't care about it. Um, they were, some of my friends were so excited, like, oh, I finally get to see you in their own words. Like, I'm so glad I finally get to see you this way because I was part of their world. Yeah. So, so I, I, I wonder about the introvert culture, whether that has actually become a part of our culture because of social media. And, and I wonder if there's a difference between the need to be busy, the OCD need that I have, uh, not OCD necessarily, but but the need to multitask because it's become such a part of my workaholic overachiever lifestyle, which I you have to be to be a professional actor. You just 
you have to be able to do all that stuff all the time. There's so many things you're, you, I equate it to spinning plates because over here's your rehearsals over here's your auditions over here's your self tapes over here's trying to master your craft. Here's monologues. You're trying to remember, like there's all these things. And one of those little plates out of the 20 is performing but you have to be able to multitask on the regular all the time. So, so I wonder about if you think that introvert culture has been a transference into, into our normal culture because of social media. And if you think that OCD or the need to be busy is the same thing as, a, as addiction and whether or not some of us can be predisposed to that. If that, that's a lot to ask. That, 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 I mean, to be honest, you could spend the next four hours talking about all that. I mean, the, the thing is, obviously, we're all like, I mean, I have to take a step back here because you've talked about predisposition. OK, and, you know, the, the, the thing I always get asked, for instance, and, you know, addicts always say is I've got an addictive personality. You know, I'm predisposed towards addiction. Can I just say, and I've written papers on this. I mean, I, I think the addictive personality is a complete myth. OK, and what I mean by that is that there is no personality trait that is predictive of addiction and addiction alone. Okay, yet we know, so we know, when we talk about what's called the big five personality traits, okay, so these are conscientiousness, agreeable, agreeableness, neuro, neuroticism, um, sorry, I've forgotten these now, uh, extroversion, and what's the other one? Um, I've forgotten. Anyway, but what, what comes, quite clearly through all the research and it doesn't matter team to matter what kind of addiction it is is for most addictions what we find there's a very high correlation between neuroticism and addiction and a very high correlation between conscientious sorry low conscientiousness and addiction of course there are exceptions so work addiction you actually find that work addicts tend to be have very high conscientiousness as opposed to nearly all the other addictions however so even if you can show that let's say we find that 100 percent of addicts are neurotic OK, if I can show you some somebody who's neurotic and they're not addicted, then what we can say is that neuroticism isn't a predictor of addiction. It's highly associated with, but it's not a predictor. And you also kind of touched on the kind of biological thing there. there it's quite clear that there are genetic and biological predispositions that may have a role in things like OCD and um, various um, um, impulsive behaviors and addictions. So, for instance, you know, I'm, I'm just I'm a psychologist. I'm not a biologist. However, you know, there is something called the DRD2 gene, nothing to do with Star Wars. Uh, and we know that the DRD2 gene is highly implicated in lots of different types of impulsive behavior, including both addictions and more obsessive behaviors and things like kleptomania, pyromania, uh, and what have you. We also know is that, you know, biologically, I mean, you, you did kind of ask me about, you know, the kind of what goes on biologically with addiction. Now, again, I'm a psychologist explaining something that, you know, a neurobiologist would explain a lot more deeply but any behavior that's rewarding and reinforcing okay what tends to happen it sets off a, a series of chain reaction in it, chain reactions in your body so for instance anything that you really enjoy doing so you, know, you get that somebody likes something on social media you've just got past your high score on a video game you, you know you've just had a wonderful you know you've had a you know a huge grant come in in your job or whatever something that really makes you you know modifies your mood what will happen then is your body produces something called 5-hydroxytryptamine, uh, which is also known as serotonin. Serotonin is, is this kind of pleasure drug. So your body produces serotonin when you feel good about something. Now, what does serotonin do? Serotonin actually helps your body then to produce its own endorphin-like substances. Sorry, its own morphine-like substances called endorphins. Okay. Now, when your body starts to produce endorphins, it then has a, 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 a kind of chain reaction and actually affects your body's internal volume system. So there's something called gamma amino butyric acid, which is you know, a body's own internal Valium. And what endorphins do, it actually inhibits that Valium response. And finally, as a result of inhibiting that Valium response, your body produces more dopamine. And again, you know, for me, I, I, can I just say that I, I, I believe in what I call the biopsychosocial model of addiction. Biology plus psychology plus sociology equals human behavior generally, but addiction more specifically. And, you know, you could argue that addiction is about dopamine deficits. You know, there is something called um, reward deficiency syndrome. You know, it's been speculated that people who don't, who have much lower what we call dopamine receptors in the body, they seek out things like social media, gaming, exercise, sex, whatever, to try and increase the amount of dopamine. So there are quite clearly biological and genetic predispositions there. We know 
For instance, if we take gambling, is if you take a group of pathological gamblers, people totally addicted to gambling, what you'll find is that about 50% of them will have this particular DRD2 gene. You'll also find that about 25% of non-problem gamblers, non-pathological gamblers also have this gene. Now, there's two implications from that. One is that, of course, it means you can have this gene, but you don't go on to be addicted because, you know, we know that about a quarter of, um, you know, non -pro you know, a quarter of people have, having this particular gene, you know, don't have any problems with gambling. But we, you know, it also says is that there are 50% of people out there who don't have this gene, but they're still addicted to gambling, which means that genetics is not obviously the only be all and end all of becoming addicted to something. And that's why psychology, biology, and, you know, the kind of social environment are all critically um, important. The other thing is, is that, you know, I do lots of my research is looking at features outside of the addict. Okay, so I do a lot of research on what we call the structural characteristics of things like social media use, gaming and gambling. The, uh, the easiest way to explain it is if I give you an example. So in gambling, the single most important structural characteristic related to addiction in gambling is what we call event frequency. So for instance, I have never ever met anybody who's addicted to a bi-weekly lotto game. You know, and the reason for that is that you know, in Britain, playing our lotto game here, you only get the result of your gamble once on a Wednesday night and once on a Saturday night. Okay. Now I compare that with something like slot machines. People call slot machines the crack cocaine of gambling. And the reason they call it the crack cocaine of gambling is unlike a lotto game where the event frequency is just twice a week, on a slot game it could be 10 times, 12 times a minute. Okay. And the whole point about that, of course, is, is that you know, you, you've always got that every few seconds, there's that chance to get that dopamine hit, basically. You know, that, that chance to increase the amount of serotonin and dopamine that's actually flowing through your body. And it's actually, you know, we know that the anticipation of perhaps getting a, a you know, a winning, um, you know, winning um, reel on a slot machine, that is getting you excited, you know, pumping around that, you know, serotonin and producing the dopamine in your body. You know, we can then apply it to things like social media. So we know, you know, that, that you know, the, the biggest uh, equivalent, if you like, on um, social media compared to like the, the event frequency in, in gambling is the like button. You know, that like button was, you know, I'm sure the person that invented that didn't realize is that, in fact, what you're, you're doing there, of course, is having that potential to be set up for people to get that, that hit time after time after time. You know, the thing about being on social media, of course, there's many, many different rewards that you could have on social media. Now, when we apply it to things like gambling, OK, you know, there is something called operant conditioning, which basically means is that, you know, we are rewarded and reinforced while we, we gamble. And that, that re reinforcement in gambling can be financial, it can be social, it can be physiological, it can be psychological. Those kind of things happen on things like social media as well, getting psychological and physiological rewards. For the, the the rewarding and reinforcing activity while people are online, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, or whatever. Um, but you know these structural characteristics on their own, okay, these are inherent within the activity. These are things that are deliberately designed into these products to actually get to get you reinforced and responding and rewarding to these particular things. But of course, if you're somebody, and you know whether it's a personality factor like you're more introverted or more extroverted, or it's a biological dis predisposition that you've got a particular genetic makeup. All of these kind of interact, and that's why there are what we call many different etiologies, many different pathways into addiction, okay? So there is no one simple parsimonious explanation why anybody becomes addicted to anything. Basically, at any one time, there may be at least 200 different competing factors. There are the structural factors, the situational factors, and the individual factors. You know, if I'm addicted to gambling, there is the inherent structural characteristics of the, the, the gambling activity of which there are in fact, believe it or not, over 70 different structural characteristics that you find in gambling. There are the situational characteristics like the marketing, the advertising, where you place your product, how prevalent your product is within a particular environment. I mean, this is why, of course, when we think about addictions online is that, you know, if you're a gambler and you're walking around with a smartphone, you're walking around potentially with a casino in your back pocket. When you're, you know, you, you've got your smartphone and you're getting those push notifications, those bleeps, I mean, those, you know, little sounds that you hear, that's a structural characteristic that lets you know there is something waiting for you. And that wait there, that thing could be really, really exciting and rewarding. And that is what keeps people, you know, those are those kind of structural things that are designed into products to get you interacting with that product again and again and again. 
And obviously, from a social media perspective, the more time that you're on something, the more stickiness there is, the more money that these the social media operators are making because there's more time that advertising can be can be sold to you. Um, you know, going back to your thing about this this introvert extrovert culture, we have to realise is that obviously there are lots of different personality characteristics. I mean, you just described yourself as um, uh, an extroverted introvert, which is probably me as well. Okay, you know, I'm somebody who absolutely loves being centre of attention. You know, I love it. You know, I was teaching this morning. I love it when students are hanging on every word that that I'm saying. Okay, that is nothing better than getting that reinforcing buzz. But do I necessarily want to? be the, the life and soul of the party. I can be, and it's usually amongst the people I know really well. Put me in a room with a bunch of people I don't know, and I'm Mr. You know, I'm Mr. Wallflower. And I, so I, I know where you're coming from when you say you're an extroverted introvert. Um, but in terms of you know, people's internet use, there is something called the rich get richer hypothesis. So those people that are already extrovert and go on, for instance, go on to Facebook and have lots of friends, things are basically very good for them but people who are more introverted and they go on to Facebook is that these people, you know, either probably had less social skills to begin with, but they actually feel psychologically better when they're online. But the fact when they're online and they're not making the friends and the connections that they see all their extroverts are doing, it's something that can lower their, their self-esteem. So, I, you know, you, you talked about that, that kind of introvert culture. I mean, I mean, I remember back in 1995, if you called anybody a geek or an anorak or a nerd, it was seen as something that's really bad. I look at my youngest son, he calls himself a, a nerd, but he actually sees it as something positive, the fact that he's brainy, intelligent, you know, whatever. And you know, the whole kind of, you know, perception of what, you know, this, this supposed introvert culture, I mean, you know, things like the Big Bang Theory have, have totally changed people's idea of what nerd and anorak and geek are, are now. And as I say, people, you know, you, you have sites, you know, geek girls, geek boys, and this is something that's positively reinforced. You know, it's actually been accepted into our culture and then, then the meaning of those things uh, have changed. But of course, you know, how people interact online will be driven by those biological predispositions that we, you know, driven by those, those different personality characteristics that, that we have. But I do want to go back to the point I was making. I don't believe that anybody has an addictive personality. And of course, the, the addicts who I speak to, they say, well, look, you know, I was addicted to alcohol. Now I'm addicted to gambling. I went on from being addicted to gambling and I went back and I actually then was addicted to cocaine. The whole point about that, that is actually something called reciprocity. Okay, that's not about addictive personality. If you are doing something, let's say you're gambling for eight hours a day, every single day, and then suddenly you stop gambling, suddenly you've got eight hours to fill with something else. And the only, you know, what tends to happen is you fill that activity, you know, you fill that void. And I use the word void quite deliberately. You fill that void with other activities that gave, give you those same psychologically and physiologically rewarding experiences. And it's not a surprise sometimes that, you know, you're, fit, you're basically, you find another potentially addictive activity to fill, fill that void. You know, when I walk into a room of Gamblers Anonymous, I find a, a, a bunch of chain smoking, coffee drinking individuals. You know, they're, yeah, they're not gambling anymore, but they might be, you, you know, doing something else that, that's kind of taking their mind off gambling. Even like, you know, what I call compulsive helping. One of my therapist friends, you know, he talks about people that have given up their addictions, but then they spend all their time trying to help other people get over their addictions. You know, they're filling that void with, with what's called compulsive helping. So, you know, the, 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 the problem is, Isaac, is that, you know, there is never going to be enough time in your program to discuss every single thing to do with addiction. It's why I'll be in a job for life. Addiction is a really complex process. And there are many, many different, as I say, these etiologies and pathways into an addiction. And you might have five individuals who look identical in terms of, for instance, their social media addiction, but the reason why they become addicted to social media, you know, one might be because of all the marketing advertising that was that was um, centered on that person. For another person, it's because of their biological or genetic predisposition. For the third one, it's because that you know they're highly neur neurotic and have low conscientiousness. You can go on and on and on and find different, you know, the, these different reasons for why why people become addicted. If you and I had unlimited time, this could be an entire day conversation. There's so much involved in this. Uh, yeah, I mean, like thinking about we we think of functioning alcoholics, people that can drink and drink and drink and drink every single minute. They're not at work, and then they go to work and they do their job. They come home and they drink and drink and drink. And so there's probably such a thing, an equivalent then of a, a functioning um, social media addict or a functioning gambling addict or 
whatever. Well, that's, uh, this is where I actually would disagree with that, Isaac. Okay, and I know we're stretched for time, and it's because I've got other things to do. But the thing about behavioral addictions is that behavioral addictions do actually have that capacity to fill up lots of other time. So, for instance, I've got I've got a therapist friend of mine who she swears to me that she you know she has work workaholic sexaholics that she she actually treats. Now, my my position is you cannot be both addicted to work and sex. OK, basically, if you're spending all your time working, you can't be addicted to sex at time. The only way that's even physically possible or theoretically possible, if you're an actor in the porn industry, maybe you are addicted to both work and sex. But then if you're an actor and you're working in the porn industry and you're so-called addicted to you know, this particular activity, for me, that's about being addicted to work. You know, Olympic athletes are not addicted to exercise. They're addicted to their work. You know, they want to win those Olympic medals and beat their personal records or whatever. Uh, the thing about drugs, of course, the reason that you can have a functioning alcoholic is that you, you know, it's quite, you know, I've met, for instance, alcoholic pathological gamblers. It is theoretically possible to be both a, a addicted to alcohol and addicted to gambling because you can do them concurrently. OK, it's quite easy to sit at a slot machine all day while drinking tequila or gin or vodka. OK, it's actually very hard to have what you call a functioning gambling addict because if you're a genuine gambling addict that is going to be taking all your time and cognitive space there's actually nothing left to actually function after that but you know somebody who you know so you can have for instance a cocaine addicted um sex addict because again you can take cocaine while having sex okay so it's actually possible in my eyes to be addicted to both of those things but for me it's almost impossible i mean i you know Everyone talks about their, you know, whether it's gambling, shopping, uh, internet, sex, whatever, is that people talk about, you know, I'm addicted to both shopping and sex. Well, again, from, from my definition, it's, it's impossible to be addicted to both of those because one of those things is something you're going to be doing all the time. That's not to say you can't be addicted to shopping, but also really like sex. I mean, that's something different. OK, and it, you know, sex might be something, OK, I have two hours of sex a day, but I shop for 10 hours a day. You're not, you know, there, you're probably addicted to shopping, but not the sex. OK, that's not to say that at some point, if you gave up shopping, you then want 10 hours of sex. But that's what we call reciprocity. But again, you wouldn't actually have these, be, you know, these these concurrent behavioral addictions. So for me, yes, we know there is good evidence of, you know, we even, even for things like people who, who use heroin is that we know, you know, some of the greatest music in the world has been made while people have been high on heroin, strung out on heroin. You know, I look at, you know, people like the Stones, Jim Morrison, the Beatles, you know, these are all, you know, groups I love but you know they were still functionally musicians and could still do these things while they were were doing heroin but I can tell you if any of them were gambling addicts is that they wouldn't be on stage singing or writing those songs because they're spending all their time you know gambling and that's the thing about behavior addictions the activity is so salient and all-encompassing and takes up all your time whereas for drug addicts they don't realize how salient it is until that behavior is actually taken uh, that particular substance is taken away I want to thank you for for giving me this much time, and uh, and I certainly wish you you luck with your with your upcoming operation and with your I think you called them screenagers. Is that what you said? Yeah, yes, yeah, screenagers. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, yeah, I, what what a what a gift it was for you to give me this time. No, no, thank you, Isaac. Okay. All right, be well. Okay, bye. For now.